welcome you here to the Alps. I hope you all had a lovely meal. Um, we are, well, we are uh, lucky to have all of our legislators here today to um, talk to you. So we're not going to even keep your attention for, on anything else at this moment. We're just going to invite the gentleman up to talk. Um, just so you know that there are question and comment cards on your tables. Um, as the conversation is uh, unfolding up here, if you have something you'd like to ask or to be brought to attention, you can do it yourself. You can raise your hand and ask your question. But if, if you're a little shy and you want to write it down, um, we'll come around and pick those things up. So at this time, I would like to invite Congressman Glenn Grothman, Senator Devin Lemonyu, Senator Dewey Strobel, Representative Terry Kautzman, Representative Tyler Borpagel, and Representative Jesse Kramer to come up onto the table. Thank you, Shelma. Stringer. 
ourselves up here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tyler Borpoggle, uh, state representative for the 27th uh, Assembly District. Uh, so the new uh, Steve Castell, I guess. You'll hear the word new uh, quite frequently today. But uh, my district covers Plymouth, Kohler, um, <coughs> northern side of the city of Sheboygan, uh, up to Cleveland in Mandawa County, southern half of the town of Mimi, and then Keel in the town of Schleswig in uh, uh, western Mandawa County, and then kind of all points in between, Elkhart Lake, Howard's Grove, uh, and so on. Um, a couple of the committees I serve on, I am the vice chair of campaigns, uh, the campaign and election committee in the assembly, and also on children and families, transportation, state affairs and government operations, and uh, I'm on public benefit reform with Jesse, which is a brand new committee this year, and um, I'm really interested in it. Um, we, it's uh, one of the things that I'm kind of researching and looking on is uh, um, dealing with total comprehensive public benefit uh, reform, how the programs that the federal government has interact with the state, and kind of where the, in, the incentives are for, for people um, to you know, go from part-time to full-time, or is there a disincentive? Um, where's that breaking point? So kind of do an overall study of our, our public benefit system. But a couple of the other things that uh, I, I hope to get my first two bills passed in next one, we're on the floor next Tuesday. It's my ever-exciting comprehensive stoplight reform package, um, which just makes some technical changes to uh, crosswalk signs and uh, the yellow arrows that uh, that we see going up that bring them in com uh, compliance with uh, with the law. So, um, but other than that, I, I guess I'll. Oh, one of the things that uh, Senator Lemick, you and I, and Representative Katzma um, were excited to do um, and uh, get. Uh, into the state budget was dealing with uh, K-12 education and actually higher education too. Uh, program uh, it repealed the program called Course Options, um, and I guess to make a long story short, um, the cap classes that we were all used to um, were sort of the, the the payment for those was being shifted away from kind of a share between the the student and taking the class um, and being shifted all onto uh, the school district. A lot of number of school districts told us that um, they just wouldn't offer the, the courses because it wasn't within the priorities. Um, so, and we thought, well, if, if they're going above and beyond, and um, the folks want to pay for for an extra option, um, they should be allowed to do that, and we shouldn't be uh, uh, disincentivizing uh, the, those courses. So, we're happy to work with uh, with the school districts in the area and Lakeland College and a few other folks to. Uh, hopefully get that thing. It, it simply reverts back to the way, it, uh, the good old way that it used to be. So, all right, enough of me talking. I'll hand it off to Senator Strobel. Thank you, Tyler. I'm Dewey Strobel, and I am the 20th District Senate Representative, and I have the honor of following in Glenn Grossman's footsteps in this job. Um, I was just elected in April, and uh, it is truly an honor to be doing this job, and um, my background is, well, I'm from Cedarburg. That's where I'm born and raised. Lived my entire life there. And I'm married to my wife, Laura. We've got eight wonderful kids. They're ages 9 to 25 now. And really, to me, that's what this job is all about. It's all about the future and all about the next generation and really what kind of country, what kind of state, what kind of place we're going to leave for this next generation. Um, I started a business in 1987. That was the year that I, that I was married probably more importantly, and really never expected to get into politics or do, be doing this type of thing. But I just, over that period of time, I saw more and more things changing, and I, it really made me concerned about, you know, what direction are we headed? What is our government doing, and, and what is our culture doing? And uh, in 2011, in early 2011, Mark Gottlieb was my state representative. He got, to be appoint, he got appointed to the Transportation Secretary. So this spot was open, and it was right during all the hubbub and in Madison and you know, early 2011, and I thought, you know, I, I'd like to be part of that. I mean, I'm a small businessman. I think I have something I, that I can offer, and I'm willing, certainly willing to work hard, and, and I, I've never been one to back away from a challenge, or, and I've always been involved and super busy, and I'm like, you know, this is something that I think I'd, I'd like to try, to try to pitch in. I look at it as 
public service in terms of what, what, what I do and, and why I'm there. And uh, it's been truly an honor to have these opportunities in the Assembly and now in the Senate. Uh, like I said, I just really came in in April here, and my focus has been on um, prevailing wage. Uh, that is something that I think we need to repeal in the state of Wisconsin, and I've been really working hard in, in, that, uh, in that vein. Uh, you know, we need to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar, and I don't think uh, the institution of prevailing wage is something that is conducive to us being able to say that. I'm a conservative Republican, and I believe in smaller government and lower taxes. And everything that I do uh, in my legislative process is always through that prism. Um, and and that, that's my focus, and that's where I want us to be, because I think that's what made this country great. And the direction that we're going in is something we need to try to push back on and push back harder. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to answering some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I realize with six politicians up here and with me on the end, it's going to be really tough to get some words in here. But, uh, I'm, again, I'm Terry Cosmo, the 26th Assembly District, which covers the town of Sherman, the town of Holland, the town of Lima, the town of Wilson, and uh, the southern three quarters of the city of Sheboygan and the city of Sheboygan Falls the five committees that I'm serving on. I'm vice chairman of the uh, Financial Institutions Committee. Uh, that's logical since I've spent 33 years at Oostburg State Bank. Uh, so this is a career change for me. Uh, we all talk about being new. Yeah, we've been in this now for, or I've been in this now for five months. Uh, so, uh, and Mike Ensley was the previous uh, legislator from the 26th district. So the committees again are the Financial Institutions, Consumer Safety, Ways and Means, Workforce Development and Housing and Real Estate. A couple of bills that I've been working on are a simplification bill for uh, uh, variable rate loans so that levels the playing field between large banks and small banks. And another bill that I was working on with Senator Lemieux uh, was to give opportunity for small cemeteries who are struggling to have an investment uh, yield so that they can pay for their uh, maintenance and such to give them some flexibility in their investment options. So uh, again, I look forward to uh, visiting with you. All right, I would like to remind my colleagues we have 10 topics, so please stay brief on each topic. I know that's tough for some of you. It's good that I'm moderating, because I'm probably the most to the point guy up here. But I, I do appreciate that three of you reference bills you're working on with me. It's a good way to uh, butter up to the moderator today. So uh, anyways, um, I rank the issues by sort of the level of interest that we're getting in, in the office. and and timeliness of it. So I, we're going to start off first with the Buck Serena, which I'm sure you all saw the, the press release yesterday. I'm going to tee it up a little bit and then let these guys comment on what they want. Uh, the proposal is a $500 million arena with half of it being paid for by the owners and former owner and the other half coming from public funding. Uh, the state share right now, as announced yesterday, is $80 million, not to exceed $80 million, $4 million a year for the next 20 years. Uh, right now, we're taking in $6 million just in state income taxes from the players. So if we do nothing and the Bucks are going to leave, if we don't build a new arena, we lose $2 million just right there. Plus, we're still on the hook for the Bradley Center, and if the Bucks leave, the Bradley Center is going to cost us all kinds of money in the future. Um, so that's sort of the basics of it. Uh, the city of Milwaukee is putting in a $39 million parking structure and a $12 million TIF, and the Milwaukee County is giving over some <coughs> debt that we have to collect for them to cover their $80 million portion. So my concerns with the deal right now, I want to make sure that the county will be on the hook if we cannot collect that $80 million. I haven't had a chance to look into that yet very much. And uh, my other concern is with the $93 million coming from the Wisconsin Center District, just to make sure that that's workable. I haven't had a chance to look through the details of that yet. But uh, personally, I'm trying to take it out of the budget. That's what we're, a lot of us in the Senate are trying to do, to vote on it as a standalone, something that's that important to the state. I think everybody should take a stand on it. So that's what, what I'm fighting for. And I, I think until I get a chance to look over all the deals, it seems like a good, the, the problem with negotiating this deal is the Bucks had all the power and the state has everything to lose. So we are sort of in a tough negotiating position. So I think, I think the deal that was reached seems like a good one at present time, but I'll turn it over for comments on the Bucks Arena. Well, I think that the, uh, the uh, important thing
thing to, to understand is that we're still, we, the state taxpayers, are still on the hook for the Bradley Center. I mean, I didn't know that before I came into the legislature. And the projected cost is over $100 million over the next 10 years of deferred maintenance. And if, of course, if the bucks move, the bucks walk, uh, there, there, there goes our major tenant. And there's certainly uh, many others. Milwaukee is the smallest TV market, I believe, in the NBA. There are uh, Las Vegas, there's Seattle, there's a number of cities that would just love to have the Bucks. And people that say, well, these are billionaire owners, let's get have them kick in some more. Well, yeah, that sounds, sounds good, but if, if Milwaukee doesn't cooperate, they can just easily walk someplace else. So that's the problem with the negotiating that, that we're under right now. I know we're going to spill some water here sometime. <laughs> said here that was pretty good so far, but I'm a small businessman and I look at the numbers. I represent the state, so I look at the state's aspect of these numbers and, um, you know, I'm not happy about it, but unfortunately it's the realities of the marketplace. And you know, we have two scenarios, the bucks stay, the bucks leave. The bucks, if the bucks stay, we're going to continue to get that six and a half million dollars in tax revenue from the basketball players, which is projected uh, within 10 years to go up to 14 million. We're going to keep that. And again, we're going to get out of the arena business, which we are in right now with the Bradley Center, with the $20 million in debt that's on that right now, as well as $100 million in future deferred maintenance. So really, it, it gives us an end, an end game out. Yes, it's going to cost us $4 million a year. This is from the state perspective. But again, we're going to keep that $6.5 million, and that amount's going, going to grow. So um, I think at this point in time, you know, we'll see what other details pop up. But I was very happy to see that you know, that is our cap. There's no more overruns are, are on the bucks. And um, and again, it's it's something from a financial standpoint. You look at the two options. I think this is uh, the, the better of the two, as, again, as much as it galls me. But it's the realities of the marketplace to keep this team. I'll try not to be overly redundant because a lot was uh, was covered. Um, you know, I, I think the best thing that this is definitely a better deal that was negotiated, in my opinion, than uh, the what we had started with, um, with that the governor had in the budget. Um, I would be uh, all uh, supportive of pulling it out and uh, of the budget and making it. Uh, um, something that everyone, Milwaukee and uh, Madison outstate has to uh, has to take a vote on um, individually. But I think I do think too the most important thing is uh, as a state we, we are on the hook for uh, the maintenance of the Bradley Center, and uh, this as a state gets us out of the arena business. It uh, gives us a ceiling on spending, and uh, as, as Senator Strobel had said, once if it uh, goes. Over, it's on the bucks to make up that share of the cost. So, um, in general, I just think it's a, a much better deal than um, originally was proposed, and it does make um, economic sense. The numbers work out that uh, we're better off with the bucks here for so many uh, so many reasons. Well, I guess I'm on the same page. <laughs> uh, I do want to pull for the budget, and I'm in a much better place than I was a few months ago. There's no way I could have ever justified what Governor Walker wanted. Uh, to my constituents. I absolutely despise the Miller Park tax. I live in Washington County. I pay it. I hate it. Um, and I am glad that <clears throat> there's nothing like this in here, but that is a, it is a fixed, here's how much you're getting every year for the next 20 years, and that is it. And as a state, I think we're going to actually wind up recouping more than we are paying. So that, that's where I stand on this issue. Thanks for your brevity, Jesse. Representative Kramer. All right, next topic is, I'm going to roll three into one. Um, Transportation budget, prevailing wage, which Dewey already touched on, and uh, Highway 23. I'll first start with the Highway 23 update. I was very disappointed, as we all are, that a judge four days before construction put a hold on it, on a lawsuit that's been going on for 10 years and we thought was settled. So we were very, very upset about that, um, especially since all the cones were up, or barrels were up, and the equipment was moved into the area, and then they moved them all out of the area. But anyways, um, on Monday, the DOT attorneys met with the judge and with a status update, and the next one is scheduled for September. Um, but if the DOT gets their numbers, they, they need to update some numbers, compile some population, 
numbers like that, uh, they can schedule that meeting earlier. But uh, we're still going to move on with the planning and land acquisition going forward because we're going to do the project. It's just whenever judges let us do the project. So um, the transportation budget, the governor proposed borrowing $1.3 billion in the transportation budget. I find that to be unacceptable, so I'm working with members in my caucus to try to lower that number. Uh, the governor said we can't have any revenue increases, tax increases in transportation, which is making things very, very tough on us because he's going to veto any, any tax increases. And uh, that brings us to prevailing wage. Um, I'm, like Dewey, very supportive of the repeal of prevailing wage. It adds costs onto transportation projects for local levels of government. It would help us, as someone who's served as a local level, level of government, I'll give you one example. Our highway transportation guys who drive the paper operators, <clears throat> when they're working on a non-prevailing wage job, they're paid $39 an hour with wages and benefits. When they work a prevailing wage job, we have to pay them $53 an hour with wages and benefits. So that's how messed up the, uh, the law is. So um, if there isn't full repeal, we better make some substantial changes to the prevailing wage law to make exempt some local levels of government and uh, make sure tax money is used as wisely as possible. So that's sort of the whole transportation budget. That's a lot of what's holding up the budget right now is trying to figure out how to get everybody on board with the transportation budget. So, But I will pass it on. We'll start with Dewey this time. We'll move it over, the mic over one person each time. I think so. Um, Highway 23, I mean, it's just an example of what an activist judge can do to screw things up with a political agenda, because that's really what we're dealing with here. And, um, and it, how, how it adds to the cost of projects like these, which is just the shame of the bureaucracy that, that, that it, it, it creates and, and continues to perpetuate. Uh, as far as the overall transportation budget, yeah, I'm not in favor of, of more bonding. Uh, right now, that debt service is just eating up more and more of our transportation dollar. I think it's 17 cents out of every dollar. If we bond at the 1.3 billion, it would be about, I think, 27 cents of every dollar. So I can't have that. I'm happy as heck that the governor is stuck in the mud about no, no revenue increasers because, again, I think government's too big. We collect too many taxes. I think we need to live within our means and not ask more of our citizens, so I'm happy with that. And we need to make critical decisions in terms of what we do with our Department of Transportation. I think we have needs and we have wants, and I think we need to focus on our needs and not so much on our, on our wants. And uh, I also then think prevailing wage is a huge component of this whole process. If we don't repeal prevailing wage, I think we are just leaving you know, the elephant in the room there. So let's take care of that, and then we can move on to some of these other things and take a look at them. But to me, I've staked my claim in the, on the budget. Uh, I'm a no on this budget if we don't make substantial reforms prevailing wage. Uh, I've been very public about it. It's something I believe in, and I sleep very well at night with that. So um, we'll see how that plays out. Things seem to be moving in that direction, but uh, time will tell. So on... 23, uh, I was coming back from Madison the Wednesday before Memorial Day and saw the signs up saying construction starting soon uh, on next Tuesday, um, and then drove and saw the equipment, or as I kept driving, saw the equipment sitting there and was all excited because it's kind of like, okay, we've been on this since uh, 1999, and now it's finally going to happen. I, the houses have been torn down, and the whole buildup, and then uh, Judge Edelman comes along, and on Friday I get a phone call that he... Uh, issued uh, the injunction that no federal money can be spent on the project and uh, that stopped the project. So I was uh, very unhappy uh, all throughout Memorial Day weekend. Then when I, I came back, I actually looked, uh, like, like Dewey was saying, uh, this is the uh, uh, one of the reasons why these uh, projects continue to increase in costs. Um, I, the the um, when I looked at the numbers of what the project was the first uh, slated to cost in 1999 when it was first enumerated, um, the current DOT projections uh, have it, it would be a 345% increase from the original cost. And that's going back delays when the project was delayed in the 2000s, when uh, early 2000s when Jim Doyle rated the transportation fund. Now, one ju uh, judicial court decision after the next, after the next, um, were uh, trying, or uh, I am, and I know uh, everyone else here is trying to work with DOT to make sure that oh, <laughs> that they uh, um, can 
rearrange or do what they need to do to keep the project moving forward. Um, we'll definitely be keeping everybody in the loop on that. Um, prevailing wage, uh, I think, uh, is an absolute must. Significant reforms, at the very least, uh, or a full repeal would, would be the best, but um, at the very least, uh, I think we need to have significant uh, reforms to, to that program. And I guess I'm getting the high sign. I'll just make two quick uh, comments. First of all, you hear about a lot about a shortage of money in transportation, both on a state level and a federal level. I think on this court ruling, you can see part of the problem is a lot of money is spent not directly related to putting together roads. Okay, This project is going to cost more than it has to cost because of the start-stop, start-stop caused by a federal judge who, on the face of it, you wouldn't guess is a federal uh, something of federal interest anyway. And I think at all levels of government, certainly on a federal level, I will do what I can to try to tinker with the laws to make it a little bit cheaper to build our highways. Because even if this thing gets up and going a year or two years from now, we know it will have cost a lot more than necessary because of all that's gone on. Just even to be almost beginning doing something uh, a few days ago and then stopping. The second thing is we do have a federal uh, a prevailing wage law on a national level to Davis-Bacon. There was a unpublicized vote taken to have prevailing wage not apply to certain federal projects. Uh, I voted to, to have it not apply, but nevertheless, we lost that vote despite having the largest Republican majority in the House of Representatives for a long time. Uh, and to a large extent, that was because we have a lot of Republicans from the northeastern states, California and Florida, some here from Wisconsin who still wanted to keep it. So that's kind of where the status of prevailing rate is on a federal level. Uh, as far as transportation, we've talked about the 23, so I'm not going to do that again. But um, I think there's, there's two major problems. Um, a lot of our projects, Senator Stroll will talk about the, the wants and the needs. We've we got to get rid of the frills. We need to pay the roads we have. Just get rid of the frills for now. Um, the governor has something called Trans 75. He's trying to eliminate the budget, and I actually support that. I, I talked to my representative on Joint Finance. I want that gone. It's something that you hear, you hear these commercials for complete streets. Well, it's something that they would mandate bike lanes going in and things like that, that communities would have the option to do what they want there. Um, and I've got a problem with Campbellsport right now. They could lose half their downtown parking because they need to put a bike lane in on one side of the road. Um, I, I also have a, a motion to get put the budget yet. If transportation stays in the budget, it might get pulled out, I don't know. Uh, get rid of the, uh, the beautification, uh, money, you know, money put toward beautification, uh, these entrance ramp arms to get on the highway that a police officer has to crank down anyway. It costs 15000 a piece to put in. Uh, closed circuit cameras that the DOT is, is putting up on all these highways and these overhead message boards that tell you how many people died last year. That's all I ever see on there. Um, so take those, take the, the frills out of the budget and, and just pave the roads, do what we need. And the other problem is keeping up with inflation, the cost of products and materials and things like that. Our municipalities obviously aren't keeping up right now, and they can't because they're not getting the money from the state. I'm, I'm for full repeal of prevailing wage in the state, so that's where I stand on the issue. Thank you. I just want to comment on the Highway 23. I read the decision. Are there any lawyers in the room here? A couple. Um, uh, and the question that Judge Edelman was concerned about was standing. And the, those of you who are in insurance agents in here, the, the same concept is insurable interest. Does somebody have, have a, uh, you know, are they really, really uh, engaged in that, in that area there? And Judge Edelman found the lawsuit from a thousand friends that there were three people that were, had standing, and in fact one of them even lived along Highway 23. So I, I'm all for separation of of legislative branch, judicial branch, ex executive branch, but it seems to me when the judicial branch has the power to put a stop to this project that has been studied and been approved by the state DOT, the federal DOT, been approved by the by elected officials who who make the decisions to spend, and then you have one judge who makes this decision based on those small little population, something just doesn't seem right. All right, we're going to move over since we have a couple educators in the room. We're going to skip education. No, we'll, we'll move to education. Move to education. <laughs> um, 
couple of things uh, that I'll just highlight the, in the education part of the budget. Uh, the Finance Committee restored the $150 first year cuts. I'm talking, we're talking K through 12 first, and maybe if we have time, we'll move on to higher education for Jackie. Um, the, we, the Finance Committee restored the $150 per people cuts from the first year and added 100 additional dollars the second year. Um, school choice was expanded by 1% for each year for the next 10 years. Um, statewide, there was Tyler, our representative or popular, already mentioned the course options, which Terry and Tyler and I worked on to uh, help the local schools. And oh, I didn't bring both pages of my education. I'm trying to remember what else I was going to say about education. But uh, there's oh, the, uh, the the budget also expanded the ability for people who don't go through the traditional model of getting a teaching degree to uh, get teacher licensed as a teacher. So um, I'll let these guys decide what they want to talk about under the education budget, and I believe it's <coughs> Tyler's turn to start first. Um, whoop. Uh, you better watch it. <laughs> Try and take them out. Um, I'll start just by maybe talking specifically about the uh, teacher, well. teacher licensing uh, portion, because I know there's been a lot of rhetoric uh, out there about what it does, uh, doesn't do. So what the proposal was actually uh, submitted by a representative from northern Wisconsin who compared with where we are have a lot, districts have a lot smaller population, are much larger um, in size, and they were concerned, they were having trouble, with, they wanted, had a few students that wanted to take an automotive class or a welding class, and it didn't make financial sense for them to hire a full-time uh, te shop teacher uh, just for one or two classes, so they were interested in going and getting someone with industry experience uh, to come in and teach those narrowly defined one or two classes. Um, there was added an alternative teacher license program, which requires uh, someone to have a bachelor's degree. The district has to find them proficient. Um, it's allowed in subjects uh, by the, that the superintendent and school board identify in core classes, math, English, social studies, science, uh, the permit, the, the license is valid for three years, and um, it's only in the district that grants the approval, so you can't go from Plymouth to Sheboygan, for, for an example. Then the permit, which is the one where they said, you know, now we're going to end up with a bunch of teachers without bachelor's degrees, um, no bachelor's de degree required, based on industry experience and learned skill, must be found proficient by the schools, applies grades 6 through 12, um, not valid for core subjects in math, English, social studies and science valid for three years, um, then the district must reapply to DPI for individuals to be re-permitted and valid only if the district grants approval, and again, it's not transferable. And then one additional important component that was left out is um, under this, the DPI has, is required to make online teacher training programs uh, consisting of at least 40 hours of instruction available for individuals who either get this uh, alternative licensure or alternative uh, permit. So um, just, I know there, there's been a lot of rhetoric, but just kind of wanted to clear up, and I, I talked to the bill author, and um, it's something that they're even working to furtherly narrow. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I do support it for those same reasons. Um, I, I have no problem with that. A lot of these people that have been in, the, been in these industries, bankers, accountants, uh, you, know, you name it, they have already been training people in the field. They're usually at the top of their field anyway, and, and now they're retiring or, or what have you, and, and they want to go on and, and educate kids. I mean, these, these aren't going to be kids in lower elementary school grades. The, uh, the, it's up to the school district whether they want to hire, hire them in the first place, whether they want to have someone there for an hour a week just to teach one class, you know, to hire a full-time person then. And they can still get rid of them. If they're no good, they can get rid of them. Just, so I, I just I don't have a problem with that. And the K-12, obviously, we, you know, we funded, we made a poll, and, and then I guess to be honest, personally, I'm a little disappointed that we went over and above because my superintendents would have been fine if we made the whole first year, but now we're sucking money from other places in the budget where where we, uh, we probably could have used it elsewhere. So that's my two cents. I think in this morning's press, you maybe saw the article that the Schwinn School District was received some uh, national uh, recognition, being 48th in the country as far as being an attractive place to be a teacher. 
and that is because of the uh, level of pay, the, the, uh, the high level of pay, uh, strong educational values, uh, cost of living is relatively reasonable here in Sheboygan, and there's a lot of amenities here in Sheboygan. So, you know, we, we, we've heard some discussion on, on, on you know, some of the hazards and such to education. I think that, that points that there's, there's a lot of good things going on here in the city of Sheboygan. We did get back to being whole for education. I probably am with Jesse. I also wouldn't have necessarily been in favor of that additional money that went. I think that, that we need to make a, a better use of the uh, Act 10 tools that are out there. I think we need to look at our teacher salaries more in a market-based situation. I'm a big believer in public education. My kids go to public schools, and I was on a uh, school board of, C of Seabird. Um, but I think that we need to take a look at you know, the educators that are in demand, uh, chemistry, uh, physics, you, those types of, of vocations are, or, or types of teachers, and they, they're going to be the all-stars. They may need to be, be paid more. We have other ones where I know in Cedarburg, we'd have a job opening up. We'd have 400 applications for that job. So I think we need to kind of settle in more at market rates on some of these salaries. I think we need to utilize the act. Act 10 to a greater degree. I think we all have seen that more money doesn't necessarily make for a better product. And I think we need to continue to get better at what we do in education. And um, as far as school choice, I'm a big backer of school choice. Uh, you know, the average voucher is $7,500. The average uh, price to educate a child in the state of Wisconsin is over $12,000. And when you're talking about Milwaukee, which is really where this is focused on, is $15,000. So I think we have a number of fantastic public schools. I think you have nothing to fear. But when there are schools that aren't doing their job, I want to give options to parents. And that's what I think school choice does. Thanks. Uh, we're going to do one more topic and then turn it over to Glenn so he can give an update. So he's not just sitting up here the whole time. Uh, I think we should probably discuss um, health care since that was, there was a lot of talk about health care early on with the governor's proposed changes. So um, the Finance Committee actually made a lot of changes to what the governor proposed. I took a lot of his proposals out of the budget. Um, but just to let you know, just to fund the increases in the cost of Medicare, <coughs> Medicaid in the state, it costs $650 million over the next, so that's what's eating up a lot of our increases in tax revenue. Um, so what, what the Finance Committee did was it put senior care back in the budget. The, we're the only state that has a senior care program, so the governor had proposed eliminating it, but the Finance Committee put it back in the budget. Um, they left the ADRCs um, in the county's control, uh, but there will be some changes made to long-term care going forward. But that they're going to take the stakeholders in the room and get their input before they make sweeping changes. So IRIS, the IRIS program, there, there was a lot of talk about the ch proposed changes to IRIS. There still will be a self-directed program under the family care model. And uh, going forward, it's going to remain the same until those changes are met. So that's important to a lot of people who use that program. But I'll turn it over to uh, Jesse first. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I actually wrote an article on this. I think it was in the Sheboygan paper. It, it showed up, too. It was a, about a month ago on uh, the IRIS, the senior care, the family care. Um, I, in, in my understanding, and, and being new in this position, I, I really had never seen the governor's budget before. I'd never gone through a budget. Uh, my understanding is that when the governor has always done his budgets, whether it be at the county level or the state level, he has always kind of thrown things in there that are very controversial to get them pulled out and have people start talking about them. And I think that's, that's what happened here with some of these programs. People are now going to talk about these programs. IRIS has some problems. Uh, IRIS is a great program, and for those of you that don't know what IRIS is, IRIS is for uh, for people to to self-direct funding for uh, their disabled child, or and, and decide where that funding goes instead of going through a, a, a MCO like like a family care type program. Uh, so what what's going to happen now? And I was in full support of pulling it out of the budget. Now people are going to all be invited to the table. All these people that work with the program, we can find where the efficiencies are. These people know that for this program to continue. We need to keep it sustainable, and they know where we can make changes and where we can make adjustments. So I think it's great that we're now bringing everyone to the table on, on these programs and actually figuring out where, you know, how, how we can keep these programs going. Thanks. Again, 
again, being new to the budget, what, what I'm really impressed, or not impressed, but what surprised me, I guess, is, is how uh, radical um, the Joint Finance Committee is making changes to what the, the governor has proposed. Uh, that was kind of a surprise to me. One other interesting statistic that I, that I learned is that there's about five and a half people, five and a half million people in the state of Wisconsin. One out of five is on Medicaid. So you can imagine what that does to our budget as we try to fund education and all of the other demands. I know in the past uh, couple budget periods that our big driver of increases in the budget have been MA spending, the medical assistance. And uh, that's why I was very happy with the governor that he uh, declined that additional federal money because in the end, we see what this did. It's $650 million in increases in, uh, for our Medicaid to our budget. And uh, you know, I don't think we can count on the federal government to continue to fund that additional Medicaid that we were being urged to take at 100% when the Medicaid that we're getting today is at 60%. So I mean, that would have been a bait and switch by the federal government. That would have, again, exposed the taxpayers of Wisconsin uh, to more obligations that that uh, you know, really we, we can't afford. So um, just real quick, I agree with, uh, with, with uh, Assemblyman Kramer, what he stated. I think some of these things in the budget are there so we can elicit a response, get, get the conversation going. I think there need to be some changes made uh, to the IRIS and to the Badger Care and to things like that. But uh, now we can have a very serious discussion about that. And, I'm, and I'm, my hope is in the next budget that we can find out ways to be more efficient and better at managing those programs. Yeah, um, when you really look at the numbers over the past couple of years, uh, it, it's really frightening the amount of uh, increases uh, that Medicaid costs us on an annual basis in our budget. And anything we can do to rein those in uh, is definitely a help to our uh, overall financial health and ability, because then we have uh, that gives us the ability to spend more in other areas where um, we, we think we're lacking. But um, I was, I was uh, pleased to see I got a number of calls from uh, constituents and, um, and emails um, about the Chief of Governor's proposed changes to the Family Care and IRIS program. So uh, I was glad to see that the Joint Finance Committee uh, changed, rolled that back a little bit. Uh, my concerns initially with the program where it was just uh, maybe taking off a little bigger bite than we could chew and there wasn't as much uh, information available, um, but I think uh, the solution that we've come to uh, really helps uh, kind of drive the conversation on how we can uh, provide efficient services to uh, people people who need them, but uh, continuing to, to realize that um, we, uh, we can't just keep going on a uh, increase uh, cost uh, cost trajectory, I and mean, that's what's killing us uh, nationally. But um, the other thing I just wanted to mention too is uh, I also was able, or uh, someone a constituent brought to my attention um, something that's really interesting and started looking started looking into. And Representative Mako from the Green Bay Bay Area introduced uh, a bill called the uh, it's a 529 Able bill, and recently the federal government allowed uh, children with disabilities to create um, accounts that, that kind of go beyond what the, the they're able to uh, have in assets and monthly income to so that they can sort of have a little bit more uh, financially stable uh, future as well. So I'm uh, happy to, to sign on to that too, and that's just kind of a nutshell of what the, the program is. Okay, can I hog it my five or seven minutes or whatever? Thank you. One, one follow-up for the state legislators. Um, so you understand why this is a tough budget, and, and, and all these guys alluded to it. It would be interesting to go back and look 15 years ago on all the lines of the state budget. The reason that this is difficult for everybody around here, there are difficult lines in the state budget, is because health care for the poor and not so poor is just swelling. I bet mean, if you go back and look, at the amount of money, say, for shared revenue, which used to be a big chunk of the budget for cities and, and counties, is probably flat. Not even adjusting for inflation. Flat or even dropped over the last 15 years. Look at the amount of money we're putting in the university. I'm supportive of the governor 100%. 
which you have in the last 15 years. That's probably not far from flat. All of the increase in your income and sales taxes is going to health care for, for the poor. Okay, and one of you guys can answer that memo because it will be real eye-opening for you. As you see some things, all these other things just flat. Uh, health care for the poor is skyrocketing. Um, talk to you a little bit about what's going on in in Washington. I think maybe I'll deal with it on a committee by committee basis. I am on four committees. First of all, on the budget committee. That's not as important as it sounds, but it sets the overall parameters for the amount of money we're going to be spending in the next year. The federal budget goes on a year that ends on September 30th, so we have to wrap it up by then. Unlike on a state level, the federal budget, what you do is you pass 12 separate appropriation bills. Okay, and we're about four or five into them. There's an element of partisanship there. Uh, President Obama proposed a budget together with tax increases, and with the tax increases, he will be able to say he will spend more on virtually every line compared to what Congress has. We've passed about uh, four separate appropriation bills so far. Um, I, in each appropriation bill, try to vote for amendments or propose amendments that will shave something off of there. The Republicans are proud that they have proposed a budget uh, that is going to result in a balanced budget in nine years. We're supposed to brag about that. I can't brag about that. I mean, balancing a budget in nine years. So we do what we can to vote for some amendments uh, in each, each, each appropriation bill to break things down a little bit. In the Senate, it is not clear whether they will pass these appropriation bills or not. A lot of you in this room are going to be disappointed because appropriation bills, as virtually every other bill in the Senate, requires 60 votes to pass, which means in addition to the 54 Republicans, you have to get six Democrat senators on board, uh, which means, to a degree, Harry Reid, liberal senator from Nevada, is going to have to have a stamp of approval on the Senate budget. Uh, at the time, if the Senate ever does get around to passing them, we'll have a committee and come out with something joint. In these budgets, we have an opportunity not to have pure policy, but to change some laws by saying federal agencies cannot enforce certain rules. In advance, you guys wanted me to talk a little bit about the new ozone rules, which will make things much more difficult for businesses, not even, not even in southeastern Wisconsin, but really halfway across the middle of the state. A major goal that I have, which will be an uphill climb, will be to try to keep the ozone rules where they are right now. So you folks are aware there is a standard, the amount of ozone that you can have in the air for each county, and when you don't meet that standard, the federal government weighs in with more onerous regulations for the businesses in that county. Um, the federal government is again talking about lowering the standards for ozone almost to the point that we're going to naturally have that ozone in the air, or at least naturally have that ozone in the area, air together with natural ozone together, which whatever's blowing up from the Illinois area. Um, it would just be devastating for American business if that goes into effect, and I will make a priority, and I am trying to get together coalitions to try to put amendments in the Interior Appropriation Bill banning the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency from enforcing those regulations. Then, of course, we'd eventually have to get those rules through uh, through the Senate and have Barack Obama sign the whole budget bill. There are rumors right now he's going to veto any budget bill and say he is holding out for more spending, which will be an unfortunately partisan thing that would go on. I am on the Education and Workforce Committee. We are dealing with two, well, really three major bills right now. We're dealing with the reauthorization of what amounts to the No Child Left Behind Act. I am doing what I can to give all the local authority I can to local school districts. We have, in the bill so far, removed the uh, ability for the federal government to prescribe any test to local school districts. I would like that bill to go further. Barack Obama has also said we'll veto that bill, whatever it is. So I think before we have a, a final change, we're going to have to we're going to need a new president. Um, the second bill that we're dealing with is the bill dealing with secondary education, both Pell grants and student loans. Uh, I think a goal I have is to have not as many student loans out there. We have a lot of kids getting student loans for degrees in which they aren't getting jobs anyway. And not to mention the total amount of debt out there is a scandal. Too many Pell Grants are going to kids who are not going very far in school in the first place, which first of all is a waste of money of their time and a waste of your money as a taxpayer. So those are the things I'll be looking at there. The third bill going through there 
which I will be a little more aggressive on because maybe we can get something done. They are looking at the free and reduced lunch program again. And some of this absolutely bizarre. I have people coming to my office lobbying on what we can put in the lunches and the sh for the Sheboygan kids. I mean, figure there's some things the federal government would realize we don't need their expertise on. I will introduce a bill and try to add it to an amendment saying we'll cut the check to the local school districts, but we will get the federal government out of prescribing what type of food your kids should eat. Right? We all learned when we were seven years old, right? Vegetables, fruit, grains, blah, blah, blah. We don't need some $150,000 federal bureaucrat telling us to do that. Um, uh, I have talked repeatedly to this group about the huge disincentives we have with regard to welfare laws in this country. I don't think under the current president we're going to have any even minor changes there. Nevertheless, I have myself on an informal committee called the Republicans. Republican Study Committee Subcommittee on Welfare Reform, uh, which I am dealing with my chairman, um, Todd Young of Indiana, trying to begin to establish things and publicize the marriage penalties that are out there so if the Republicans do take over, they realize this is a crisis that has to be solved like yesterday. Uh, I've told you guys before, the number of people on food shares, 17 million in the year 2000, 47 million today. 17 to 47 men in 14 years. Obviously, if you talk to so many employers around the area, you hear a complaint, a lack of people working, and even if sometimes they have people working part-time, they don't want to work more because it digs into their benefits. They don't want to raise because it digs into their benefits. It's just destroying our country. Um, also on uh, um, government oversight, Oh, I'm sorry, is this a, a sign? Oh, it's okay. That's okay. Well, 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 that's okay. You can cut me off. I'll hang around and talk to the folks later. Uh, government oversight, and I have a couple bills related to that, deals with, I guess what you call scandals, IRS scandal, environmental protection agency scandal, uh, secret service scandal, and finally the uh, Joint Economic Committee, which doesn't need as much, but it's an important committee for me to be on because I meet senators. Uh, I don't know how these guys feel about it, but at least in the Capitol, whether you want to or not, right? The assemblymen and senators run into each other all the time because you know you run into each other in the rotund, right? <laughs> uh, one of the one of the downsides of the of the federal capital is the senators are all on the north side of the capital and we're all on the south side and our office buildings are further south. Their office buildings and committee hearings are further on the north. And I could spend all week and not see a senator, which really isn't healthy. So I'm glad to be on a joint committee so I have a chance to meet the senators because networking and getting to know those people is important for me to accomplish things. So thanks for having me, and I won't dash out of here, I think, too quick. So if you have any other questions, I'll answer them then. Do you want me to keep going? It is 1.15. Hey, we have some questions. I know. Okay. I have five or six questions here. First question, civics exam. Yes or no? I, I think it's foolish, but it's not going to hold up my vote on the budget. But I, I like the idea. Yes or no? Yes or no? All right. For, for or against? I'm going to vote yes, but I'm against. <laughs> uh, the civic, civics exam in general, uh, I talked to uh, Carrie yesterday on the phone, and um, it, I'm not a big fan of standardized testing, any more testing, and anything like that. It's unfortunate that we, we had it in our committee as a separate bill, and I was prepared to vote against it, but uh, I, I, it's just such a small piece and a larger piece of the budget. I can't vote against the budget. Yep. Yes, assuming I can pass the test. <laughs> All right, next question. Funding voucher schools. Uh, how do you sustain both voucher and public schools? I'll, I guess I'll start. I think it's our responsibility to fund and pay for education and give options to all parents, especially if they can't afford those options. I campaigned on that. Everybody up here campaigned on that. I think it makes public schools uh, more responsive to to competition, and I think it's it's one size doesn't fit all for for all kids. So we see that in higher education, where we have great private colleges, public colleges, and I think that goes down, especially for parents who can't afford other options, if the public option is not for them. So I don't think it's choosing one or the other. And, and Dewey mentioned earlier that it's actually less expensive for the state to send for a voucher. And the voucher expansion is for kids not currently in private schools. So that's important to know. There was a memo last week that came out 
that, uh, that estimated the cost of voucher students was $800 million with the argument that we're running uh, two different systems with that amount of money. There was another study that was done that didn't get the publicity, and that was an estimate of total K-12 education over the next 10 years to be $94 billion. So in other words, 800 was only was less than 1% of what the total estimate was. Uh, I, I like the way that the school choice uh, proposal was put into the budget. It sort of mirrors what we have now. Uh, we actually have a public school choice program. It's called Open Enrollment. So if you don't want to go to, if you live in Plymouth and you want to go to Sheboygan Falls, I don't know why you want to do that, but um, <laughs> the, the, you, can, you can currently uh, have that option to go from one public school to another. The home district I don't know the exact numbers, but keeps about 20% of the cost to educate the students, and then the 80% goes to the uh, neighboring school district you open and roll to, um, and that this would be the same sort of setup for school choice. The home public school district would keep about 20%, and then the uh, choice school would get uh, about 80%, is how I understand it. All right, next question. As voucher schools expand, what type of accountability would be required of these schools? Yeah. Nothing changes. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of accountability. In, in the working. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, if you want to touch on that, but I ultimately believe that accountability lies in parents choosing the right school, but. Uh, They do. They have to do get registered with the state. The state oversees it. I mean, there's all kinds of accountability. Yeah, there's going to be audits. So financial yeah, audits. financial audits. All that's be all that's included. So. Yeah, but actually, that was my question. I was talking more about the testing. Oh. Students and how will we know that the students who are going to the voucher schools are going to be accountable for the learning that the students in the public schools are accountable for? I believe they're already required to take the current tests, the Smart Balance. If they have students, but I'll look into that. But, right. but like I said, I think accountability is ultimately the responsibility of the parent. Um, while lots of Medicaid increase, sorry, I should have read this ahead of time. While lots of Medicaid increase is in the cost of health care, will there be any reduction or costs, any reduction of costs as more are employed? I would think so. Yeah, the more people that are employed, less people that are going to be on Medicare. That makes sense to me. Right now, we have 80,000 job openings on the Wisconsin Job Center, so that's, that's exciting news. Well, I will have a comment on that. When I talk about the welfare stuff, you right now, it is not hard at all to find employers who have employees who say they will not work more hours because they'll lose their badge or care. Okay, so there's no question in my mind we have people today who are underemployed because of the perverse incentives in that program. And I can understand why, because health insurance is expensive, and, you know, saying I'm going to forego a six or $10,000 raise to hold my Cadillac health insurance sometimes makes purely financial sense. Next question, what is your position on reducing prison recidivism enhancing re-entry to productive life, and ending mass incarceration in Wisconsin. Who would like to do it? Well, that's kind of the topic of the day. Um, I, to me, it's not all that complicated. If you break the law, you should go to jail. You, know, you, should, you need to pay a price to society for breaking the law. Now, I do have some thoughts about people who are in our jails and that deals with recidivism. I think there's, I'd like to really see a better mechanism so when people are in d detention that they're actually doing something productive so that they'll be a better citizen when they get out. And, you know, more emphasis on getting GEDs or acquiring skills or what have you while they're in incarceration and possibly if they show that they have a, obtained a, a GED or they have obtained a skill, maybe one could look at as incentivizing that type of behavior. Maybe you could get out a little sooner if you've shown that you proved something to make yourself a, 
a, a better citizen once you get out. Um, but I am not in the camp of saying these people that you know we're arresting, we're we're doing the wrong thing, we're putting them. In, no, I do believe that you know we need to disincentivize that type of behavior. We do that through incarceration, and I also think part of it is some of those people just have to come out of society because they're a problem in society. So that's how I feel. But as far as once they're in being incarcerated, I do think we need to do a better job at reforming those people so when they get out, they can contribute to society in a better way. Grover Norquist, a nationally known conservative commentator, was in Madison a while back and uh, advocating for um, simplifying and, and, and having some of the uh, uh, sentences to be diminished and smaller, uh, so there could be some bipartisan effort that would, that would accomplish that. Just to piggyback off of what Terry said, I went to the uh, Grover Norquist uh, thing. Uh, it was a great presentation, bipartisan group of people there. Um, but one of the things you learn really quick is uh, you, when you first get in, you're on five committees. There's about 30 different committees, all with their unique different specialties. And uh, so you, you kind of look towards your fellow uh, representatives and senators uh, who kind of become experts over time in issues. And Representative Rob Hutton, from the, I believe it's Brookfield area, um, has kind of been working on uh, this this sort of thing. So um, I guess that if nothing else, the question prompts me to go back and talk to him and kind of educate myself a little bit more on uh, on what he's working on. So. And the last question: Our thoughts on restoring the funding for the HAP program, the Harbor Assistance Program. I actually have two harbors in my district. Uh, both in Sheboygan and in Manitowoc, and so I've actually done a little research on this. Um, it's a $10 million budget item, and um, I decided not to make a budget motion, motion to put it back in, because I think putting a set amount without having the need there, we need to make sure that we are helping these hard because they're very expensive to uh, when you have to do harbor restoration, but I think we need to fight, look at each project on a case-by-case -case scenario decide to put it in the budget, sort of like what you do with the transportation. We don't just set transportation at this amount. All the items we look at one at a time to see if they're, well, we don't, but transportation committee does. Anyways, any thoughts on the Harbor Assistance Program by anybody else up here? No thoughts on the Harbor Assistance Program. Well, that's all the uh, questions we have. Thank you all for your time, and uh, we'll probably stand up here if you have any more questions.